context. According to the Victorian Albert Museum, the average 17th century woman wore a petticoat and two layers of undergarments. Her pocket would be tied around her waist in between her under petticoat and petticoat. Women essentially had to get undressed to access the contents of their pockets. So even if they could carry their personal items around with them, they couldn't get to them out in public. And thus the inequality of men and women's pockets was born. Verve Team, September 10th, 2018. Welcome. My name is Margaret. I'm a historical costumer and textile conservator in training, and today I have a really interesting video for you. So I've been having a lot of fun over on my TikTok, sort of showing off some of the pieces in my study collection and just connecting with people over there. You should definitely go check out my TikTok. It's at Costume and Conservation. I filmed a little tour of one of my early 1860s dresses, and it had a pocket in it. Do you want to know the best part? She's got a pocket. And I got a question from a viewer very nice, asking me when they started taking pockets out of women's clothes. And my response was that they never stopped taking women's pockets out of clothes. You know, there are, there are instances where there are less pockets and pockets change and the things kind of move around. And you know, she was very nice. And she was like, you know, I, I thought I read an article where, you know, they were talking about how pockets were sexist and women didn't have them because there was like this conspiracy with the handbag industry to sell more handbags. And I was really intrigued. I wanted to know what this article was. I wanted to know, I wanted to read it. I wanted to know more about sort of what was being said about pockets. Because I do remember back a couple years ago, I had been seeing some, you know, highly historically inaccurate articles and videos about pockets. And I was like, okay, so I tracked this article down, or what I believe to be this article, and I found that there's quite a few of these articles. There's one from Vox, there's one from Verve, there's one from CTV, there's one from Today. You know, they kind of go on, and the funny thing about these articles is that they're all the same. They sort of follow this general formula. They start out talking about how in the medieval era, people wore belt bags, and then, you know, in the 17th century, men got pockets sewn into their suits for the first time, and women got tie-on pockets, and they're all like, what what the hell is a tie-on pocket. There's a, there's a beautiful quote which I read you at the beginning of this video in which someone completely misunderstands how an 18th century tie-on pocket works. Just very funny and I will be getting into that in a little bit in this video. But you know they talk about the 18th century, they're very disparaging to the tie-on pocket and then they completely miss the entirety of the 19th century which I find intensely baffling because that definitely happened and was definitely a point in fashion that is important to talk about in relationship to pockets but yeah they skip the entirety of the 19th century and then they move on to the suffragette movement which there is a strong connection with the suffragette movement and pockets and i think that honestly is a different video than this video i will mention it slightly it baffles me because they sort of relate pockets to the oppression of women and Historically, women did not have as many rights as they do today, and you know, we, we still have quite a bit of ways to go, societally, definitely. But I kind of want to counter that feeling. You know, pockets are not the symbol of women's oppression. Pockets are the opposite. They are the symbol of women's resilience and autonomy and ability to carry our own things. Because what I want to show through this video is that pockets wane and wax. They come in different shapes and sizes and configurations throughout women's clothing history. However, when they are gone or when they are insufficient, women get very angry. Women wear pockets and sew their own pockets into their clothes, even if it is unfashionable or impractical to the style of garment that is being worn. And I think that it's important to talk about pocket history in a far more nuanced way. This is really not a topic you can squish into a five minute video or a small article. And it's definitely not a topic that you can really squeeze into this video either. This is just a continuation of a conversation. This is not the end all be all. I really think that the study of dress history needs to look into this topic more deeply. There needs to be more publications about this. There needs to be publications themselves on 19th century pockets. I really don't see any substantial publication. I, I mean, I really couldn't find any substantial publication on 19th century pockets. A women's pockets specifically, if the, you know of any primary sources, you know of any other articles of a scholarly variety um, that talk about pockets, especially in the 19th century, please pop them down below. I'd really love to read them. 
I really want to dive into this topic a little bit more and understand it from a material cultural standpoint because that's really what I focus on is material culture. I am a conservator so I work directly with that material culture. I will say there was a video that came out recently by CBS like literally while I was doing the research for this video and that is actually a pretty good video so I will link that down below. They also skipped the entirety of the 19th century but it gives a little bit more background on pockets as they relate in a social context both men and women. So that's a really good video because it, it talks about more of the ephemeral and intangible aspects of dress that we're not really going to get into today. More, we're more going to focus on material culture and you know how pockets manifest them in, in actual clothing. I also definitely think you should check out the V&A article on pockets. This is a shorter article about 18th century tie-on pockets. We're going to go over a lot of that material today, but this is the article that every other kind of pop history article takes information from and cites. And it's just, they wildly misinterpret the book. Like wildly, I don't understand. The, the, the quote I, I read you about a woman undressing completely where they cite that V&A article. It's like, no, in that V&A article, they show you how to access pockets through your petticoat. It just, it baffles me. I really wanna dig into that today and I wanna have a conversation about how pockets are incorporated into the material culture that we can see, how they are something that women hold on to and how they really empower women and how when they leave us, when pockets get smaller, how we get angry about it. So please keep watching if that's something that you would like to learn about. A large portion of the research for this section of the video came from The Pocket, A Hidden History of Women's Lives by Barbara Berman and Ariane Fenito. This book gives a very detailed history of the tie-on pocket and is perfect if you're interested in learning more about tie-on pockets. You can find it at major retailers online and I will link a couple below. In the 18th century, women's tie-on pockets were at their height. These detached pockets could be worn singly or in pairs with multiple sets of tie-on pockets used at some points. They could be accessed by a slit in the side of one's gown or petticoat. I made a highly decorated embroidered Bargello pocket for my first video, which will be up in the cards. Although you might think these are inferior to men's sewn in pockets, I want to counter that notion. Tie on pockets allowed women to store whatever they wanted, wherever they wanted. Pockets could be put under any layer that you wanted, stored close to the body for security or even on the outside of your clothes for easy access. Pockets could be easily taken off and stowed in a secure location or even given to someone else as a vessel to carry things in. They could be plain and hard wearing for a working woman selling her wares or highly decorated for the fanciest of occasions. One major asset of a pocket like this is that it did not put any stress or strain on the garments that were being worn over it. This is especially important when clothing was very expensive and being able to make your garments last as long as possible was key. Additionally, these pockets could be worn under a variety of styles of dress and lasted the entire century. They were so widespread that unlike many other aspects of dress, they were used widely throughout all classes of society. They were just the workhorse of the 18th century and allowed women freedom of movement with as many things as they wanted to carry. However, I think it's important to note that there are a lot of other ways that women carried around their personal objects, both in the 18th century and moving forward. First off, from about 1750 to 1770, pocket hoops were used. If you want to see more about pocket hoops and my process of making a pair, you can look up in the cards or down below in the description. These panniers functioned essentially the same as pockets, but gave a very large amount of real estate for anything that you wanted to carry. You could probably fit a full baby in there if you tried. Women also stored small things just tucked into their stays, very similar to how I stored my phone in most of middle school. Another very overlooked garment was that of the apron. Aprons often had large patch pockets sewn onto them, but aprons themselves could be a great stower of things by just taking up the bottom corners and walking around with whatever you needed to carry stowed in between. Additionally, in the winter time, muffs were often used, which had pockets sewn right inside of them. And in a pinch, you could take off your kerchief or fichu and bundle whatever you needed up in that. Items that were made by men's tailors for women, such as riding habits, did in fact have men's style sewn in pockets to them. This, of course, hints at the varied gender division of labor in the clothing industry at the time. 
Tie-in pockets did have their drawbacks though. There are many reports of women losing their tie on pocket. And of course, famously, Lucy Lockett lost her pocket. This one slight drawback, however, did not stop the pocket from carrying on. And as we see, this style of pocket lasted far longer than you may think. The 19th century is very often overlooked in terms of pocket history. None of the articles I've mentioned, including the v &A article and this new CBS pocket video, which I think is actually pretty good, did not dive into the 19th century at all. I will say Abby Cox just did a video on five historic Victorian dressmaking techniques, and she did mention pockets, so I will link that one down below as well so you can go check that out. There seems to be this notion that in the 19th century, pockets just kind of disappeared with new Regency fashions. Although the Regency did definitely take a toll on lovers of pockets, being that the silhouettes became much tubular and much slimmer, pockets did not disappear. Traditional tie-on pockets did go through a bit of a transformation. They became longer, lighter, and sleeker to go with the new neoclassical lines. Pocket slits were still added into these dresses in some occasions, and these pockets would have been worn at that higher waistline. The pockets were no longer seen as fashionable though. They of course were not given up by working women who needed them for their everyday activities, but more fashionable ladies would often take them off for fashionable occasions. This is of course the birth of the first modern handbag as well, called an indispensable reticule or ridicule. <laughs> it was carried by high fashion ladies. It didn't fit much. It was kind of more an accessory than an actual functional thing. For my very limited research on 1820s dress, I haven't been able to encounter a lot of it in my professional life, unfortunately. It seems that pockets began to be sewn into clothing around 1820, 1830, somewhere in there when skirts started to get a little lower and a little fuller. The Workwoman's Guide, published in 1838, has directions for making up both tie-on pockets and sew-in pockets. So it seems that at least by 1840, women were being able to choose between both of them. By 1860, tie-on pockets were very, very old-fashioned, although they were still being worn by women of the working class. One of Jack the Ripper's victims, Catherine Eddowes, was noted as having three tie-on pockets when she was murdered in 1888. It seems that tie-on pockets were used right up until the end of the 19th century, but you never know. There was probably some holdouts well into the 20th. As for sew-in pockets, there's virtually no research that really coagulates this type of data into one place. Berman and Fenito call the sew-in pocket, quote, an isolated phenomenon, which I do sort of have an issue with. And although they are right in saying that the pocket was a very singular choice, there were no sort of societal regulations or standards for these types of pockets. They were all different sizes, all different shapes, and placed in very esoteric places. I do have to say that this was a widely used phenomenon. People had pockets sewn into their 19th century dresses. Because, oh my goodness, there is so many places to put things in a 19th century skirt. Whether it's a crinoline dress, whether it's a bustle dress, or a walking skirt of the 90s, there is a lot of real estate to put pockets in those skirts. Pockets in 19th century skirts moved around a lot. There were watch pockets and bodices, especially in the 1880s. There could be one sew-in pocket on a sauna side of the skirt, or two sew-in pockets on both of the sides. Often I see pockets in the back next to the opening of the skirt. And sometimes you get really weird stuff happening, like one time when I saw a pocket that was placed under a swag of an 1880s bustle dress. That one I think was a mistake on the part of the dressmaker, but it would be very funny to see a woman lift up the side of her swag and just like shove her hand into a pocket. With that all being said, I can tell you from my personal observations and also looking through my collection of historical extant garment pattern books, that a grand majority, probably around 70 to 80% of dresses made between 1840 and 1900 had at least one pocket in them. They often had multiple, two, just depends. It depends on what the woman wanted in her dress. Because in the 19th century, women would work closely with their dressmaker to have their dresses custom fit and custom made for them. They were very intrinsically part of the dressmaking process. So a woman got to choose how she wanted to carry her items. This was a very individual choice. 
If a woman wanted the ability to carry around her things with her, whether it was day, whether it was evening, whether she was rich, whether she was poor, she could do that because she had the autonomy and the voice in the dressmaking process. On a practical note, pockets of the 19th century were normally made out of sturdy cotton or linen, the same fabric that would be used to line the dress. They came in many shapes and sizes, but they most always had a tape extending from the top of the pocket to the waistband to be able to even out the distribution of weight of whatever was being put into the pocket. Additionally, sportswear for women, which was still made by men's tailors, did have masculine style pockets in them. The 19th century was essentially pocket heaven. You could have whatever you wanted, wherever you wanted. It might not be seen as, as practical as a traditional pocket, which could be easily adapted to many situations, but it still had a very important place in the women's wardrobe. New day, new cashmere sweater. We're gonna veer into a cul-de-sac for a little bit. While researching and filming this project, my computer was sequestered by the Apple Geniuses for about two weeks, which gave me more time to sort of attempt to find images of 19th century pockets, which is very difficult. Museums, dealers, they don't normally show pockets in their photographs, which is, I get, they're not like super exciting to look at. While I was searching the internet for those photographs, I did run into a couple of other 19th century trends that are wild, wacky, and do sort of pertain to this subject. So please humor me while I list them off. So I think we need to talk about a little bit more about the reticule. You know, going into it, it is sort of the first handbag, modern handbag per se, and there are a lot of reticules that I've been seeing, mostly in fashion plates, and you do have to remember that when the reticule was being used, the only visual representations we have of them, of women actually using them, are gonna be portraits, fashion plates, essentially, prints. Um, so I've been looking through the fashion plates, mostly from French sources, and it seems like, although some reticules were definitely the sort of ornamental accessory type, you know, the ones that look like pineapples or are just like mesh bags on a string, those do exist and are wonderful and weird. But there seems to be a trend of reticules that are actually quite large and roomy and are essentially just pockets that you carry around on the outside of your person. So there is that. I do, did want to clarify that reticule um, issue where that the reticules are somewhat functional. Jig's still up on that one. I think there needs to be more research on sort of actual carrying power of reticules. That would be very interesting. Could you fit an iPhone in a reticule? Sort of looking through this, I also found some later 19th century trends that I think are worth mentioning when we are talking about pockets. First is the Chatelaine, also dubbed the Victorian Swiss Army Knife. Chatelaines were used in ancient times. They were used in the 18th century. They're essentially a piece of jewelry, a brooch, or a clip of some type that would be suspended from your belt or your waistband and then hanging off of it would be various objects. Could be keys, scissors, needle case, all that kind of stuff. All the kind of stuff you would need in a day. It's like a keychain, but on your person. I did find a contingent of women, mostly nurses, that seem to wear these as a marker of their jobs. So there's a lot of portraits of nurses wearing chandelines as a part of their work uniform. House, they were also really popular with housekeepers. If you are a fan of Downton Abbey, you will know that Mrs. Hughes wears a chandelier of her keys in most episodes. I think it's also important to just quick mention muffs and aprons. They're still around. It's also an interesting trend that I saw more in like the 1860s, maybe 1850s, where there's a lot of pictures of women posed with tiny handbags, just tiny handbags, obviously not at all functional, not at all functional. But it's very interesting that they would wear tiny handbags in their photographs. I don't know, more definitely needs to be said on that, but I, have, I don't know what to say about that yet. I think my favorite trend that I dug up, and one that is truly beyond me, is the 1870s parasol pocket. Hello, Editing Maggie here. Um, I have been looking into these parasol pockets that I'm going to be talking about in the next segment um, since I recorded this video, and it seems that the... Jig is still up on whether or not these pockets were actually used to hold parasols. I tend to think that they are because they're parasol shaped at parasol level. Um, I've also seen that they've been used to hold fans as well. So I've been doing a lot more research into this. You're probably gonna see a whole nother video on just parasol pockets to be honest. But um, yeah, so I just wanted to make you aware of that, that there's more research that needs to be done 
on these parasol pockets and I will be getting that to you sometime in the future, maybe, hopefully, because let me just say the research is very scant at the moment. So just note that before we proceed. Thank you. Now this caught me by surprise. I did not know about this trend. And I think that this is emblematic of our entire pocket discussion here. There are pockets that you don't even know exist in the 19th century. The parasol pocket is uh, in the 1870s, in the first, in the later, later half of the first bustle period. You, you had huge skirts. You might as well pop a patch pocket on there in a parasol shape so you can cross draw your parasol out whenever you need to. These are, you know, long triangular pockets normally at the mid-thigh region of this huge skirt with an abundance of ruffles, ruching, ribbons. They're obviously quite fashionable. We see them in fashion plates. We also see them in very fancy dresses. I think that the parasol pocket is something that we probably should bring back. <laughs> I don't know, it seems, it's like, it's wild. It's one of those things that like, you cannot make up. Because who thought of that? Okay, so that's it for our wacky and wonderful 19th century carrying things trend. We'll let you get back to past Maggie. Now, for my personal observations of seeing many historic garments and in all of my pattern books, pockets seemed to disappear around 1900. The silhouette at the time had very snug hips and wouldn't really allow for pocketry. Tie-on pockets seemed to be abandoned during this period too, although they were probably worn by some working class women. I wanted to pop in here again. Hi. 20th century is when we first get snapshot photography. So women in the early 20th century, we see a lot more candid photographs of them, which is great because we can actually see what they're wearing on a day-to-day -day basis instead of like what they've decided to have like their portrait in that they're paying a lot of money for. It's important to mention that there are a lot of photos of women with handbags, just walking around living their lives with handbags. When the pocket seemingly disappeared around this point, you don't really see it in accent garments anymore. The handbag did come to fill that void. Whether or not that is something that women wanted or you know, asked for, to be, to be debated. However, this pocket drought became strikingly political on the backdrop of the suffragette and women's rights movement, something that is put in striking focus when one reads Alice Miller's satirical piece, Why We Oppose Pockets for Women. These women were looking to adopt men's style pockets into their everyday dress. And they got that wish in the late teens and early 20s when men's style garments were being adopted into women's dress full force. This included designs by Coco Chanel, as well as military suits during World War I. By the 1930s, women were starting to widely adopt pants into their everyday wardrobe, which had large style men's pockets. During the 1940s, women adopted many pockets into their wardrobe in order to have functionality when they were working in the factories during World War II. This really cements the modern pocket system we have today, where the men's style pocket reigns supreme and the women's tie-on pocket is a thing of the past. Now, as a person who wears a lot of vintage clothes, I do have a lot of pockets in my 1950s dresses, even in some of my 1950s cocktail dresses, and I have large roomy pockets in my 80s and 90s style denim jeans. So how did we get from sort of vintage pocket abundance to where we are today? I can say the landscape for women's pockets in this modern day of 2021 is not equal to that of our male counterparts. Is this because of sexism? Yes, sort of. I mean, there's definitely a sexist lean to it because of the gender division between large pockets and small pockets. There's something to be said about that. I'm not super versed in that aspect of dress history and the gender politics of it all. I know I've alluded to it a lot throughout this video, um, but I do focus more on material culture and I really wanted to come at it from that angle. However, I do think that this issue is much more complex than just they make women's pockets small because they don't like women. I think there's a lot more aspects to this whole pocket fiasco. So I'm going to present three of those aspects that I think might be contributing to this modern pocket drought. Firstly, the fashionable silhouette for women over the past 20 to 30 years has not been conducive to pockets. We first had the low rise jean in the early 2000s where there just is not space to put a pocket. 
Then along came the skinny jean and the jegging, which frankly, also no room to put a pocket. <laughs> Unless you wanted to like squish your phone into your thigh, that just is not gonna, that's not gonna be a fun time for anyone. And thirdly, the adoption of, you know, leggings and yoga pants. Again, really no room to put a pocket. I mean, you can try and they've tried, but you're not gonna be able to carry the same things you would in say, you know, a pocket in an 1860s skirt in a pocket in a pair of leggings. It's just, it's just not happening, unfortunately. That being said, I have definitely seen instances where you could put a pocket in there and people just didn't. Um, and that leads me to sort of the second point, which is that we are in a system of manufacturing in which the consumer is so far away from the manufacturer of their own clothing that we have no say in what happens. We also have limited choices and it creates this sort of mystery and air around clothing and the way that it's made that even if you wanted to put a pocket in later, many people don't know how to do that. In the 19th century, in the 18th century, you know, even before that, women had a lot of say in the making of their clothes. Since the adoption of the Mantua in the late 17th century, dressmaking was a women's trade. So women were making clothes for other women. Men weren't even part of the process. Now that we've sort of transitioned into this model of clothing where the consumer just has nothing to do, like barely anything to do with the manufacture of clothing, we are getting a, a level of dissonance because probably contributed to the Stroud and Pockets. Thirdly, and I think this is probably the most relevant argument for this is the adoption of the fast fashion system. The fast fashion system is a type of manufacturing in which the efficiency and cost of creating a garment far outweighs the functionality of that garment. Manufacturers try to cut costs at all corners. That means manufacturing in countries where wages are really, really inexpensive using very, very inexpensive materials and streamlining the manufacturing process so that <laughs> the sewing is as just efficient as possible. This means that the extra fabric and extra skilled labor used to put pockets into clothing is often not done. The materials used in fast fashion, these cheap materials, cannot support pockets normally. They're just so flimsy, so stretchy. The pockets are gonna warp that garment out of shape faster than it will already get warped out of shape. So these three things combined, including the fashionable silhouette not being conducive to pockets, the manufacture of clothing being so far removed from the consumer and the fast fashion system to completely cutting costs wherever they can has created this pocket draft with, you know, a healthy dose of sexism probably sprinkled somewhere in there. So this dis pocket disparity is real. So what can we do about it? First, I would encourage you to learn how to sew and sew in pockets to your heart's content on any garment you want, because you know what? It's your wardrobe and you get to decide what to do with it. Secondly, Buy vintage. I love vintage jeans. They have great pockets in them. And if that's a style that you want to go for, that's a really great way to get more pockets into your life. Additionally, support companies that make a point to put pockets into their clothing and just tell the system through your dollar that pockets are what you want. And honestly, speaking out about your love of pockets really, really does help. Now I think women have a good future when it comes to pockets. Styles are changing, pants are becoming a little baggier, and people are speaking out on this subject. So I think we have some beautiful pocket days ahead of us. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please, again, if you have any other resources on historical pockets, link them down below. I really, really do want to see them. This is a conversation I would love to continue with all of you. Now, if you did enjoy this video, I encourage you to like it and also subscribe to the channel. I've got a lot of interesting videos coming your way. Additionally, you can follow me on Instagram at Costume and Conservation, where I show snippets of projects I am working on. And you can also follow me on TikTok at Costume and Conservation, where I show off my study collection and give tips and tricks on how to store your historic garments. Now, I hope you have a great rest of your day and I will catch you in the next one. Bye.